Hey lovely people of the internet, I am back and this week's video is another one comparing a Harry Potter film and a Harry Potter book and it is the turn of Prisoner of Azkaban which is actually probably my favourite Harry Potter book so um, yeah it's quite a fun one to um, compare so let's get started. So first up, my general overview was this one definitely had a lot more differences than the first two did for sure and there was lots more bits that either got cut or got swapped around weird places in order so it made it very difficult to follow along um, with my book notes whilst I was watching the film to try and do a comparison. I had to keep pausing constantly so I think that was a very indicative sign of um, where the future books and films are going to be heading because the books just keep getting longer so um yeah, it was interesting. I do like both, but I do prefer the book more in comparison to the film for this one, for sure. So I will start, as usual, with my top similarities. So first up is Aunt Marge and the scenes with her. There are some lines, I think, that aren't included from the book, but you don't need them all. I think they get the general essence of her, um, the actor is really good for Aunt Marge, um, the general scene works really well, I love the blowing up scene that looks great, she floats outside in the film which is different um, and a lot more dramatic um, but yeah and you've got oh you've got my one of my favourite Harry Sass lines um, which is when he's playing up um, the character for Aunt Marge that Vernon wants him to do, um, so he's like, oh yeah, I, loads of times is the SM that the cane's been used on him loads of time at the fictional school that he supposedly goes to because he's a troubled student. Um, yeah, so I'm glad that got included. Um, so that's definitely a top similarity. Next um, one would definitely be the night bus. I think the night bus is done perfectly. The design is great. They incorporate the main things that the night bus does, like the fact that it has the beds that roll around all over the bus. Um, Stan and Ernie um, are spot on. The talking head is an addition, which I'd forgotten because I love that addition so much in the film. And I like the fact that Harry um, ends up hitting the glass twice, which he doesn't um, in the books, but I think for the film that has a way more dramatic effect and really shows off how crazy this bus is. I love Crookshanks in both. I am a little bit disappointed that um, he's a much smaller character in the films. Like he doesn't have as big um, a role to play. And like, I don't, it's not mentioned that like he's a Neasel. Um, and like the fact that he's actually really intelligent and he's not your average cat, that's kind of, that is kind of brushed over a little bit, which is a bit disappointing, I'm not gonna lie. I love that because Harry ends up staying in Diagon Alley um, when he runs away from the Dursleys, that um, he ends up staying in the Leaky Cauldron um, with the Weasleys and Hermione because they're all there. It's a bit smaller that bit in the films, but um, I like it's still included because yeah, it's, a re it's got some really nice, lovely, funny scenes in the book, which is great. The Dementors are perfect, I mean, one of the, one of the most horrible characters, but um, done so perfectly in both super creepy and yet the way they're visualised in the film is spot on. Only thing I did notice is that um, rather than just their presence making Harry faint two times um, they affect him before the lake scene, um, they're technically sort of starting to use the kiss, which I get look, probably looks better on screen, but it's technically wrong. Slightly annoying. The um, Draco line, you fainted Potter um, in both the books and the films about the Dementors, that's great. I love Lupin in both, and I'm glad that they kept the essence of Lupin. I think one criticism of a lot of the characters is that some of them are too old, so Snape, Lupin, Sirius, um, they're too old but the actors are so good that it kind of makes up for it and they get the general essence of the character, so that's good. Um, but yes, I do love Lupin in both of them and I love his scenes with Harry and you just kind of, yeah, it's that bit of sweet that you wish that he had been able to be more involved in Harry's life because it would have been so sweet. Trelawney is another character that is done really well in the films from the description in the book. She matches perfectly. Emma Thompson does the character such justice. Um, she has less scenes. Um, Again, that's sometimes what happens when you do the adaptations, but at least we get um, some of the key lines that um, I think are quite funny. So it's Ron's prediction um, for Harry and the tea leaves, which is saying that you're going to suffer, but you're going to be happy about it. I'm glad that was in there. And then obviously the infamous line, my dear, you have the grim. So I'm glad that's in there. That had to be included. 
I love book beak and yeah he's perfect in the films it's interesting that there are more hippogriffs in the book than in the film but I get that that would have been a CGI consideration so they kept it just to one um let's not be too challenging um I do think it's funnier though that um in the films um everyone steps back and that's why Harry is the first one to um approach Buck Beak, whereas actually he does volunteer in the books because he's really conscious of um, wanting Har Hagrid to have a really good first lesson. Um, so he actually volunteers, but I think it is funnier um, in the films that he doesn't. I like the time turner, um, the way that's um, included. I think the design in the film is probably a bit more interesting than in the books. Um, it, there is, it is slightly different, it doesn't have the rings, I don't think, um, in the description in the books. Um, and I like um, how you kind of get hints as to what Hermione is doing in both. I think there's a little bit more clue-wise in the books because um, there's more emphasis on like her timetable. Like Ron and Harry see that more often and they make more comments on her timetable so then that kind of leads you to be like, oh yeah, something's going on. Um, but yeah, but um, it's, it still works well in both. I like one of Lupin's first classes with the Boggart and the Ridiculous spell. Um, it's much shorter in the film than in the books, but they keep the key ones, which is obviously Ron and the spider, and um, Neville and um, Snape in his grandma's clothes, which is just great. I'm glad they, like, they keep the outfit to the T of how it's described in the books, which is perfect. Um, I like the addition in the films of the line from J.K. saying this class is ridiculous. So that's really funny. I don't know why it's such an infamous line, but I'm glad that we have turned to page 394 in both. I'm glad that they kept the damaged broomstick in both. However, it seems slightly odd in the films, just because we have one Quidditch match <laughs> in the whole of the third films where his broom gets damaged and then it's not mentioned until right at the end that he needs a new broomstick, which, you know, obviously if there were going to be other Quidditch matches, that was important, but, um, <laughs> but yes, it seems a bit odd, but at least, yeah, they did keep it because it had to be that Sirius gets in the fireball, so. I think the Marauder's Map is done perfectly in the films in comparison to the books as well. Interestingly, I'd forgotten that in the books, um, it's little figures that appear on the map rather than footprints. I think I might just about prefer the footprints in the film. But yeah, but it's, um, I like it's, it's done well for both, which is really good. I think Honey Jukes is spot on between the two. I like that um, we have this, the scene of Invisible Harry um, tormenting Draco, Crabbe and Goyle by throwing stuff. Um, actually, it might not be Crabbe and Goyle in the films, is it? I think they change one of the characters. Um, but yeah, but still, he's throwing stuff at them and they can't see who it is. It's slightly different in the film to the books because they kind of... Um, mush two Hogsmeade scenes together um so um yes Harry's throwing snow in the films whereas it's mud in the books I think I prefer the snow and then it's interesting that, yeah in the books um the cloak comes off Harry so then Draco kind of knows that it was Harry whereas he doesn't in the films so that's a bit of a change I think either works but I'm glad they still kept that scene in for both because it was really funny I like the scene where um Hermione hits Draco although I think it's definitely a punch in the films, but it's not in the books. Um, but yeah, and she's like calling him like a foul, loathsome. So yeah, that's great, perfect. And Ron being really impressed at Hermione and both for doing it. Trelawney's real prediction, I think you could not have included that, because that is pivotal later that she does occasionally have an accurate prediction. Um, but yeah, it's a bit of a, it feels more rushed, that scene. But um, yeah, I'm glad it's still there and it's, um, yeah. Emma Thompson again, she does a great scene as Trelawney having that prediction. Sirius is another character that is good um, in the films as in the books. And you have the um, the line, are you going to kill me, Harry? So yeah, that had to be included. Again, Pettigrew, not a nice character, but done pretty well in the films in comparison to the books, I think. Um, and like, it's it was in, it's good to include him sort of groveling to Harry, Ron and Hermione yeah, sort of in his, the separate ways that he does. Cause it's, yeah, it's just making him really that like snivelling, um, insipid character that, that he is. So yeah, that was good. And then I think the scene with Lupin changing into a werewolf and then them ending up down by the lake with the Dementors coming and the Patronus and stuff. I think that, that, that whole bit was all pretty similar 
um, between the two and done really well and really effectively, which is cool. Um, interestingly, did note that in the book's description of werewolves they have slightly more fur. I think I almost prefer in the films the way they've done it that there's a lot less fur. I think it makes, yeah, werewolves seem almost, yeah, more, more alien, more, yeah, not nice. So yeah, I think that was an interesting choice. And now I'll do my top differences. So I will start off with quite an important one, um, which is at the very beginning when Harry is studying under the bed covers. Um, he uses a torch in the book because funnily enough he can't use magic, yet he's using magic right at the start of the film. Yet it's mentioned later that he thinks he's going to get expelled for blowing his aunt up and it's like, but you did underage magic like a scene ago, which you're not supposed to do. So that was a weird choice. Like I, like, I like it more in the films that you have Vernon coming in and out more often and that's quite comical, but it's just like, he could have just used a torch. He should have just been using a torch, he should not have been using his wand. I miss um, the inclusion of Black being on the, um, Sirius Black being on the Muggle News um, in the film, just because it's then, and again then, because you know, then you can't include it at the end. Um, but yeah, that then Harry's mentioning to Vernon at the end, he's like, oh yeah, you know that um, criminal that's on the news? Um, he's my godfather, so he might want to be nice to me, that kind of thing. So yeah, I think it's a shame that we don't have both of those included, because it's quite funny. It's such a shame how little we see of his say in Diagon Alley, because we miss um, the character of Florian Fortescue and him like sitting at the ice cream parlour and doing his homework and eating the ice cream. And we actually see a lot more of Diagon Alley itself, um, which is quite fun in the books, but... I guess, yeah, it was one of those things they couldn't include everything. I do like the addition of the school choir um, in the film though, which is not really included in the books. Like, I don't think there's ever a mention of there being a school choir, but I quite like it, although they are in it for like one film. But um, I really like that song and that scene, and um, I think that's one of the reasons that the third film feels the most Halloween-y to me out of all of them. But um, yeah, so I like that addition. You do notice it when you've recently read the books and then you watch the film the lack of Quidditch, which I've already mentioned because of the Firebolt stuff. But um, yeah, it, it does it does feel very odd how little Quidditch there is and it means that yeah we actually have our first um, encounters with Cedric and with Cho Chang in the third film, but obviously we then bring them in in the fourth one instead, which is kind of fine, but it was interesting. And um, we also miss some funny scenes with Wood being like desperate to win the Quidditch Cup because it's his last year, and we miss the funny scene with um, Draco um, like and that dressing up as Dementors to try and scare Harry off his broom again and then um, Harry ends up actually producing a Patronus which like chases them away and gives them a fright and that's actually really funny but yeah it was one of the things that was timing because it does it feels like it does feel like there was so much to cram in like you don't think it in the book when you're reading it um, but you're like oh yeah this could have been a really long film if we tried to include some of this stuff because some of the more because uh, some of the more complex stuff also felt rushed, which was interesting. Oh, I don't like it. It's one of those things that I've touched on in the first two so far. It's some of the changes they made to the characters, which I don't like. And it's um there's a key scene in the third book where Snape is taking the Defence Against the Dark Arts class, um, and he's being really nasty to Hermione. And um Ron just like agrees with him, and in the books he actually like stands up for her and it's it's like you asked a question and she answered it. Like what more do you want type thing and it's like yeah it's such a shame that they take some of that element of Ron's character away in the films like quite a lot as well um yeah it's a real shame and it bugs me I do like some of the um visual things they did in the films so obviously that's not going to be in the books um but I do like um yeah some of the scene change things they do so you have Hedwig flying into the snow as it transitions to Christmas and you have the Whomping Willow like um dropping leaves because it's autumn and like shaking off snow and stuff so yeah I like those kind of nothing to do with the book because you wouldn't have that in the book but it's a nice difference I do find and yeah this comes back to when I was saying um that some of the complex stuff feels rushed and yeah what what that um covers is that yeah they don't really explain the marauders backstory properly they don't explain Snape's history with them properly the history of the Whomping Willow and its connection to Lupin properly and it's kind of like I get why they probably thought it wasn't important to include that, but I do feel like those are some information bits that you will miss in the films, and I can't remember how well they then have to backtrack in later films. But yeah, it's a bit odd 
how they, they don't touch on those things quite as much as they probably should. They do also downplay the Crookshanks and Scabbers issue and then the feud between Ron and Hermione that that causes. And then it then becomes less important the case with Buckbeak um, because them working on that is what brings Ron and Hermione back together and like mends the friendship. And that's almost not mentioned and I almost think it's like, I'm like, oh, I love Buckbeak. But I almost feel like if I had never read the books, would I like Buckbeak as much? Because would I care so much? Because there's all, like almost no mention in the films of it being really sad that he's lost this case. Yeah, it's a very odd one, but it's, I feel like, yeah, it's not touched on enough in the films at all. I noticed that um, because they have shrunk down the number of Patronus classes he has with Lupin, that um, yeah, Harry very quickly gets good at the Patronus, which he does not um, in the books. I kind of get why, but it feels odd um, that he picked it up super quick because it's a really complex spell. Um, but yeah, and he uses a memory that is entirely not mentioned in the books at all. And it's like he had some real memories that he used, like some memories like we were aware of as well that he used in the books. And it's like, why didn't we just use those? Anyway, um, little things, but um, yeah, kind of irritating. Yeah, to change around the scenes because we don't have Harry getting seen by Draco, um, when the invisibility cloak comes down and then that means that then Draco goes and tells Snape what Harry's been doing, that Harry's been in Hogsmeade when he's not supposed to be and then that then means that we have the scene with Snape taking the map off of Harry and having the map like insult him etc that whole bit um we have we instead because we don't have that we then have that Harry sees Peter Pettigrew on the map which I don't know if that's meant to be more helpful to help because we yeah because they really condensed down the whole explaining the serious Peter Pettigrew thing um later that was like meant to make it more obvious it's like yeah he's still alive um without really having to like say anything he's just on the map um but yeah and then we have yeah Harry's off following this Peter Pettigrew because he's like why well, is Peter Pettigrew on the map and then we have Snape catching him and having the map um but yeah but it's just a bit weird because it's like yeah he doesn't see him on the map at all no one's ever seen him on the map Fred and George never saw her on the map, apparently. Oh yeah, it's um, it's not an important thing for them to have included in the films at all. But um, I do, yeah, it is interesting that we miss out Neville um, being in real trouble with everyone because he keeps writing the passwords down and then dropping them and then that's how Sirius is getting into the Gryffindor common room. Um, and so then he gets a howler from his nan um, and he gets really severely punished. Like no one's allowed to tell him the passwords at all and he has to sit and wait whenever he appears for someone to let him in and just things like that and you're just like oh it's so sad Neville it's so sad it's really condensed down as well the issues that Hermione has with divination um and so then when she kind of like storms out it kind of feels like a bit of an anti-climax because it's like we haven't seen how much she hasn't gotten on with divination and all the issues that she's been having with it and also the fact that she's having issues in general with her ridiculous timetable and that by dropping divination that will give her some time back so actually it's really useful for her that's like yeah it's almost barely touched upon so it kind of feels odd part of downplaying Crookshanks's character means that yeah they change how they get into the willow the Whomping willow um secret passage which is kind of not important and it is more dramatic the way they end up approaching the willow and getting into it but yeah it's just a shame that Crookshanks just loses this whole part of it his character in the film. Coming back to what I've said about not liking one of the changes to Ron's character, it's then the additions they add to Hermione's character that just weren't necessary and it's because the films always seem to be obsessed with Hermione. Um, but yeah it's the fact, so yeah some of the changes that they have um, with the when they're like changing the past um, and saving Buckbeak and Sirius. Um, it's yeah it's the fact that Hermione then is the one who works out they can save Buckbeak as well in the books it's Harry. Hermione doesn't always work everything out sometimes it's Ron and, Ron and Harry um, but yeah and then they added in extra stuff so like throwing the stone to get um, to make sure that they realise that Dumbledore and um, Fudge and that are all coming so they leave Hagrid's hut. Um, Hermione being vain which was a really weird one because normally they make her character better um, and they made her character worse um, being like yeah does my hair look like that from the back that was weird. Um, then her howling to take to get the werewolf to run away from Harry to save his life was like that wasn't in the books and kind of wasn't necessary. Um, 
her figuring out how to get Buckbeak to move so they could say so like they get him out of the way before they all came out of Hagrid's hut. Yeah, it's just little things like that and just kind of bugs me because I'm like, it wasn't all about Hermione. I like Hermione's character, but that didn't need to be done. And then a key thing that they don't include is Dumbledore explaining why it's important that Harry saved Pettigrew's life because that's really important all the way on in book seven. But hey ho, we missed it out. It's actually a crucial bit in the third book. It's setting up a lot for the later books, but we cut a lot of that stuff out because they didn't realise how important it was going to be. Um, always the way with book adaptations, but yeah, so it's a shame. So that's my thoughts. Overall, I mean, it's not, it's not the absolute worst adaptation in the entire world, but yeah, it's just some of those, um, the more complex bits that they cut out and they didn't give as much importance as they maybe should have done, which is annoying. Some of the stuff I'm like, it's just my personal preference that I like those bits in the books. And it would have been great if we could have had like, you know, twice the amount of film time <laughs> and you include everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just more complex bits which are annoying. But um, yeah, overall I don't mind it as an adaptation. And actually it was fun watching it this time around because I've recently been to a bunch of different Harry Potter film sets, um, particularly in Scotland. And the third film is where you see the vast majority of where I was. So I was there like, oh yeah, I felt like I've been there um, because I hadn't been to all of the exact locations, but I'd been to enough of it. I was like, oh yeah, I've been to all of this. This is great. I love it. Um, so yeah, so that was actually a really nice thing this time around watching the film um, and kind of made up for my annoyances with the adaptation, which was good. Um, but yeah, so those are my thoughts, but what are yours? Um, let me know in the comments down below. Um, if you like this video, do you ever give it a big thumbs up? Um, if you haven't already, do hit that subscribe button so that you are notified when I do upload a video. Um, I'll pop some links here to some videos that you might be interested in because you watched this one, and I will see you in my next one. See ya.